Well, my name is Eric Harrell, and I am the CEO of Keystone Education Group, and welcome to the Keystone Higher Education Fireside Chat. I'm very pleased today to um, be interviewing Jan Gullickson, who is the Vice President of Digitalization at KTH. The purpose of the podcast is to interview innovators and change agents in the higher education industry, those leaders who are leading and making change in, in higher education. And Jan is one of those uh, change agents and one of those innovators um, in our space. And Jan currently is uh, Vice President for Digitalization um, at KTH in Sweden. Uh, he's held and, and holds many leadership uh, roles from Chairman of the Swedish Committee for Digitalization in the Ministry of Enterprise. He's a, a digital champion of Sweden serving the European Commission, a Swedish representative and Vice President in the IFIP General Assembly, Professor in Human Computer Interaction at KTH, and he's, of course, the Vice President of Digitalization at KTH. Jan conducts practice-oriented action research on usability, accessibility, and user-centered system design, particularly focusing on improving the digital work environments for everyone and championing the value of lifelong learning beyond the typical university years of 19 to 25. With a passion for math and a background in theater and performance, Jan started his academic career at Uppsala University uh, which is Northern Europe's oldest university, as a master's student in engineering physics. And he was also a PhD student in systems analysis. And then he became a professor in human computer interaction before he made his way to one of Europe's leading technical and engineering universities, KTH, Royal Institute of Technologies, where he's been there uh, for 13 years. So welcome, Jan. Thank you very much. What a pleasure to be here. No, it's excellent to have you. So just to kind of kick things off, um, it would be great if you could tell us more about your role, uh, more about KTH as an institution, some facts and figures. And then, of course, when you're talking about your role, it would be great to hear more about your, you know, what your current priorities are, what opportunities and challenges um, that you're facing today in your role. Thank you very much. Yes, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. Um, I mean, I started 13 years ago at KTH uh, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. It's an engineering school. So basically, we have 15,000 students of engineers and architects that, that we're educating. Uh, I mean, you have different universities in Stockholm with Karolinska Institute doing medicine and Stockholm University basically doing all the rest. So, so therefore, we the three universities universities are a good complement to each other in that. Uh, being a researcher in human-computer interaction, I've always been very interested in the use of technology for very many different uh, situations, and, and particularly taking an interest in how people use it for work. And as this is something we do as university teachers at all times, I think I could also take that with my leadership skills with me to to get this position as vice president for digitalization at the university. We have uh, six vice presidents at the university with different specializations from sustainability to gender equity to internationalization on to, to education and research and so forth. And uh, mine is then actually the first vice president for digitalization to my knowledge in any university in Sweden. So it's that means that KTH really recognized that digitalization is and will be the one of the biggest change factors for for universities uh, in in the future so so i'm happy to try to on a strategic level push digitalization and make that that happen in in that sense but but <clears throat> In some situations, I may say that that when because I'm quite a lot out speaking at conferences and so forth, when I I start complaining about universities as the worst organization when it comes to digitalizing themselves, I as a joke I sometimes say that I I got this position simply because that was the best way to silence a critic uh, uh, in the organization. But but I'm uh, trying as good as I can to to actually make management staff and students understand the benefits of digitalizing and, and to improve uh, the university um, further on that. And I've done that now for, for close to six years now. Hmm. Maybe if you could just give a bit more background on KTH as an institution, just, uh, just to help yeah. 
I'd, I'd be happy to. It's um, um, it's a rather old university now. We're turning 200 years in a, a, a few years' time. Uh, it was founded in 1827, and then as an, an uh, engineering polytechnic, in a sense, one of the first in, in Sweden. Um, it's it's uh, basically now we call ourselves KTH uh, the the acronym, but, but uh, uh, in the from the beginning it was the Royal Institute of Technology, so it had a, a connection to to uh, our royal house as well, in that sense. So so we, as I said, we have about fifteen thousand students, uh, about five thousand staff working with that, of which uh, I believe it's three hundred and. 40 something uh, full professors uh, as all divisions uh, within engineering we struggle a bit with with uh, gender equity but but uh, actually i think that we have improved a bit even if i'm not satisfied with that yet uh, among the students we have 35 percent females and 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 um, yeah. 65 percent uh, uh, males in that sense i think we could be much better but that also is also of course reflected in the fact that it's only 20 percent of the professors that are are the female um we rank quite well we rank among the the top 200 depending on which ranking list you you look at but among the top 200 universities in the world um which is good because that means that we also get a lot of great students from all over the world to come to our university to to study and, and um, uh, take our courses so i think that that that's has been a, a a big opportunity for us. Uh, we're also one of the biggest suppliers of engineers uh, to the labor market in Sweden. So basically, if you take us together with Chalmers at Goth in Gothenburg, uh, together, I think that we have like 60% of all the engineering students in Sweden. So therefore, the things that we and we collaborate quite a bit uh, as well. The things that we can do uh, together uh, has then the potential to change the the entire education system within this in in Sweden. So so uh, that I think is a, a really a, a good opportunity in that. No, great. Thanks for that additional. I think color. It's really helpful. I think for our listeners. So uh, you know, the, obviously the the topic for today is the path to digital education um, at at KTH. I think one thing that would be very interesting to hear at the outset is, um, you know, what what is the state of affairs today at KTH? How, what is the, you know, if you look at the at the pool of students, you know, how much are doing pure 100%, you know, on campus, 100% um, of their education is on campus. How much is the hybrid of of online and on campus, and then what's 100% online? Be interesting to kind of get a, a a sense for where KTH is now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I can tr try and do that. However, it's it's be it will be a bit of second guessing on that because everything now is kind of blended. You you yeah. you you participate in in digital formats even in the classroom. So whenever you try to measure these things, the 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 uh, data is, is basically messed up. But I usually tell a, an anecdote about this that I think is is quite funny in a sense but it's a true story that uh, a few years before the pandemic what what happened was that that um, uh, our uh, director of undergraduate stu studies came to my class uh, one day and said that Jan we we have a big problem with your education these days and I said well what's that well it seems like the students have stopped coming um, but I've solved the problem this guy said he, he said that that I've now decided that from now on your lectures will be mandatory. So we've solved the problem. And and the only thing you need to do is hand out a, a, a form that where people sign that they, they've been there. And then he was looking at me and saying, well, by the way, you're vice president for digitalization. So of course you want a digital attendance list. And I said that, well, basically, I don't think it's the attendance list that should be digital in that sense. So I, I, I asked him the opportunity to ask around a little bit among my students to figure out what, what happened. And um, I then immediately started talking to one of the students that had come to me before uh, the, the, the course started, before the module started and said that, well, you know, Jan, I have 
I have several disabilities. I, I, I'm dyslectic. I have have autism and 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 so forth. And and I wonder, is it okay if I film your lecture? Uh, because then then i can go back and look at small chunks of it one after the other and, and repeat it and, and in that way learn much better and i thought of starting to talk with him and i i wondered how what what experiences he had from this and he said well it's super great i mean this is the first time i've really felt that i could follow somebody's lectures when you allowed me to do this and and i said well that's super great but it doesn't really explain why people aren't coming to to class anymore and then he said well by the way i actually uploaded your your films on facebook in a particular group for the class so so everybody in the classroom has access to that and then i continued around and, and speaking to other students uh, to to figure out what they thought about it and i got these amazing stories i i mean there was there was a girl who told me that she she had found software where she could subtitle my lectures and and she she had translated it into persian and she was sitting with her entire family looking at at my lectures as entertainment on the friday night um and discussing that and and there was another guy that I was talking to that said that your film lectures are super good because I think you speak so slowly. So I always listen to you in double speed. And in that way, uh, it becomes twice as effective to or efficient to do that and so forth. And I think that, that these these uh, statements from the students, uh, they what they show is actually where the innovation is in a sense that that who's who are the ones that are really changing the way that we do things at the university well basically it is the students they they were there long before the pandemic and 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 actually wanted to do a lot of digital they they may have found the author of the the textbook uh, had given lectures online or doing a ted talk and had listened to that beforehand so so i think that our students actually started to do a lot of, of uh, this digital transformation long before we did as, as teachers. So I feel now that, that um, when I do a class, I have 500 students in my class. Typically there's like 120 in the classroom. And I, I believe that the rest will, will uh, either not go to class at all, but otherwise uh, consume the, the uh, digital versions of it, because usually today we, we film everything and, and put it there. And basically also we have this idea of flipped classroom as the approach uh, that is recommended to, to do so that, that our uh, so that we can make more well-produced movies out of the, the things that we we do and in that way provide a much better student experience with with uh, taking our our classes so i think that that even if if uh, our uh, online lectures i i mean this one-way communication that we're doing which of course then should should have already long before the pandemic have been a, a, a film version that you could watch when whenever you like in, in whatever pace you wanted to do. Uh, but that will probably remain that way. But still campus plays an enormously important role for the students to come and, and collaborate with each other, to do more advanced problem solving or analysis uh, work in relations to what we're teaching them. And, and we as teachers, we need, of course, also to be on campus, but then we become more like mentors uh, for, for our students, helping them to understand and, and use the knowledge. So I think this is one of the biggest transformations that we've had of a, a, a business uh, like, like this uh, ever, actually. Yeah, and, and how much would you, I mean, I want to dive a little bit more into the, the life of a typical KTH student now, because uh, I think it's really interesting just to hear how you guys have, you know, how you've kind of set things up, making the best use of the on-campus experiences with, with the online experiences. But um, what do you think has been the, how, how would you sort of weigh the influence of the pandemic on, on the development transformation versus initiatives that you guys had underway prior to the pandemic? 
Yeah, uh, I mean, when uh, I think it was uh, 13th of March uh, in in uh, uh, 2020 when we uh, when the pandemic hit and, and the the president of the university decided that now we should go completely digital uh, in a sense. So so from a Thursday afternoon until mon- Monday morning, uh, more or less everything was transformed into to being digital. And it worked over all expectations well. Uh, I mean, the fact that, that the usage of Zoom uh, actually uh, doubled 150 times uh, um, uh, when it came to the most advanced things, and it still worked, was, was quite amazing. You wouldn't really expect the technology to manage such a, a, a big uh, 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 power uh, increase in in what what they're using so that worked well but it was something that we would refer to as as emergency remote teaching right we 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 sort of we did it not because we thought that it was a pedagogical idea behind it but but simply because we had to because campus was closed uh, and we did that, I think, basically also because Trump Trump said that it would be over by Easter, right? So so uh, then we thought that that after Easter we could go back, but that turned out not to be true. And 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 then we saw that that actually, uh, not long ago, it was two years that we had been in in um, more or less lockdown. We we actually opened up uh, last fall. Uh, for a few months before the Omicron started to to uh, hit us again on that, so so um, uh, so basically, still, I think we're uh, we're facing the consequences of the pandemic still. So we're not sort of beyond this, even if all restrictions are gone and and the pandemic is no longer considered as an, uh, a dangerous pandemic for the society. So. Uh, uh, but we had tried things beforehand. I mean, um, like uh, seven or eight years ago, we had a big initiative to get started on doing MOOCs. And uh, um, we we had uh, put several MOOCs up on edX and, and tried to use that and experiment around that with, with the, the uh, uh, as a new way of doing pedagogics on that. And, and I believe we learned a lot on that, but it wasn't like a strategic move. It was just like a hunch that everybody else is doing MOOCs now. So we need to try that as well. Uh, and uh, but we could actually take some of the knowledge learned in that process of of introducing these MOOCs and and make use of that. Then when we moved into to um, the digital room, uh, one one of course really tricky thing was the digital assessment on on how you can make sure that the right students show that they were the one that that actually uh, could manage the course and and things like that and and. Now that <coughs> that was really something that that we needed to to develop and and spend quite a bit of of time and resources on on making that uh, uh, much much better. And I think that also uh, teachers then discovered uh, more and more the 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 power of actually making more formative assessment than summative assessment in the end so so they could make use of quizzes and and other types of things to sort of sense to what extent the the message that had been conveyed had been received by by the students in in uh, in in that sense and of course, there's always things that were never possible to digitalize. I mean, a big physics uh, lab, you can't really do that in that way. But I must say that I had some really clever uh, um, uh, innovators among the teachers at, at our university. I, I Particularly one guy uh, that I'm thinking of that actually is was doing a course on physical computing and they wanted the students to actually build Raspberry Pi type of, of thing so he actually identified where the students were living and then he shipped out to groups of three students that lived close to each other the equipment uh, so that they could could build these uh, computers uh, and the functionality together with themselves and then they could report this on zoom meetings with the teacher and it worked really well to do it in this way as well 
certain way. And this means that you, you could do actually quite also physical labs over uh, internet in, in this way and make it work in, in, in a good way. So I think that that's, um, that's really an important uh, experience that we could take with us for the future. Hmm. So, so we've come out of, I guess you can, it's fair to say that the pandemic was a, was a real catalyst um, to going all digital. And it probably, I think, I think most people would agree that it really accelerated uh, change and transformation in terms of moving more to digital. Would you say that you entered like prior to, because one of the topics or the themes that you talked about when we talked um, before the call was we, you talked about the student centric model and much more student centricity. Do you, did you enter like prior to the pandemic? Did you view that was a university more uh, teacher centric? And you've kind of exited the pandemic, and it's more and it's become more student centric. Or was that did you was the university quite student centric to begin with? Well, uh, it, it's an interesting thing that, that you're asking. I think that, that, I mean, basically I would want to say that we were very student centric uh, because I think that's the, that's the right thing to do things, right? But, but I think that, that also the fact that, that our entire education system is very modularized and, and you have a teacher that is, is specialized in their particular course and maybe doesn't even see how that fits together in the big jigsaw puzzle of, of things that the students need to take in on this. So, 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 so therefore, I think that, that uh, all of this change that has happened now has led to this discussion on how do things really fit together and how can we make a better journey for the students through through their education and, and to help them to learn to get the skills that they they actually uh, need in a, a good way and uh, there's many things that, that we we um, have used for a long time to help in that i mean we've been a cdio university for for a long time and use that type of pedagogy in, in the things that we're doing, which, which is then, a, a, of course, a, a, a very normal thing to do being an engineering um, university in that. But then again, also with the focus on trying to become a, a, a very highly uh, reputable university when it comes to ranking and so forth, of course, research becomes very important, but we struggle to, to actually uh, uh, say that, that teaching is as important as the research is and that we should focus on developing that as well, uh, which then naturally then means that, that when you have topics that go out of fashion or where the industry do not want to employ people with, the, with that specific capability anymore, uh, you can't continue to, to teach a, a specific subject that nobody wants to do and the industry doesn't need simply because you have a teacher uh, that are specialized in that area. So, so I think that, that what we recognized also, which is perhaps easier being an engineering school than being something else that that we need to become more agile we need to be able to change much quicker to be able to take up new new fields uh, and and be able to to actually uh, produce entirely new educations much more quicker because today, I mean, if I want to uh, propose a new engineering education in AI, actually a question I got from, from uh, the previous minister of education that we had, I, I tried to investigate, well, what would it take? Well, typically you have two years of administrative processes and, and tailoring to make that education become uh, acceptable through the the uh, fitting with the higher ordinance that we have for the education and then you have a five-year education program here and and so basically if you were lucky you would have the first ai engineers uh, being uh, out of the program after seven years and when when i brought that message back to our minister of education that wanted me to be more quick on producing an ai education she just said well i was hoping that you would have educated these people before the next election which was five months later so so 
basically the the ideas of of what uh, uh, I mean it's a big tank ship that we run yeah. in a university and it's very big uh, very difficult to change it at the pace that you actually would want to do in that sense. Mm. No, I think this is because um, one of the interesting topics that you, you touched on that I've touched on with a number of my guests is really the market driven curriculum, you know, what's driving curriculum changes and adding courses, things like that. And what I've seen at a number of the uh, leaders that I've talked to in the last 12 months is there, there's much more um, engagement with the market, much more engagement with industry uh, to, to get input on what skills they're looking for. And then that input, that close collaboration partnership then factors into adjustments and tweaks to the, to the curriculum and the addition and actually subtraction potentially of, of certain courses. Yeah. Um, you, how you guys, I mean, how do you have a formal process for, I mean, what kind of processes do you have for keeping, um, you know, abreast of the changes in needs of where the jobs are? Because, I mean, ultimately, everyone, pretty much everyone is going to university to get a job, um, yeah. ultimately. So, so how are you guys staying up to date on what the needs are of, of of industry in in Sweden and, yeah. and another outside Sweden. Yeah, I mean, first of all, we have a, uh, we have a, a few strong strategic partnerships uh, at our university. A selected bunch of, I believe, it's fifteen uh, bigger companies and organizations that we frequently exchange students with, exchange staff with, do projects with, and, and provide also specialized educations for and so forth on this. And of course, their voice on on this and the feedback that they give. Is, is hugely important for, for what we're doing. But I mean, these are also the, the sort of well-known, maybe older companies in a sense like Ericsson or ABB or Scania or, or, or these companies. But then when I was a dean a few years ago, I, I remember I, I had this really interesting meeting because I, I was contacted by Spotify, who, who actually is, is probably the... the the uh, company that employs the most of our computer science students in the end so so they were saying that they actually wanted to provide some feedback to to our education and what we were doing and i had had a great meeting with them where they provided really useful feedback on on the way the ways that we, we were teaching and the interesting thing was that that it wasn't the sort of normally expected feedback like you need to you need to do more Java programming uh, for the students or stuff like that. But it, they, it was really that they were saying that, well, nowadays, what we expect from the students is the ability to learn. We, we need you to educate students that are uh, that know and realize that that they're not fully educated once they graduate and go to a company. They need to continue to educate themselves. So if we could could sort of provide them with with these skills of being able to continue to learn, that would be a great thing. We need students that are great at at going into really really big projects but we feel that the students that come from you they're really good at solving a small predefined problem by themselves uh, individually but but when they're coming to us they're working in the team with thousands of people developing on the same code and they have no skills whatsoever of what it means to work in in such a, a big project of that type and, and we were also getting a lot of feedback on these uh, uh, 21st century skills that that uh, they they see a bigger and bigger need for from the students both to be be uh, responsible uh, ai uh, developers or responsible coders and um, be able to be good at presenting their work and communicating and writing and talking about it and, and also have a sense of the user and be able to to sort of grasp uh, the psychology behind them and so forth so so we we really got quite a lot of useful uh, uh useful information from from that type of organization uh, as well 
And uh, the interesting thing, when I brought that information then back to the people in charge of the education, they said, well, we already have Ericsson telling us what to do, so we don't need this one. But it turned out that they come with completely different feedback yeah. to us. So, so we really opened up to have an, uh, a different discussion. Then we also actually have a, we have a great innovation factory at KTH where, where uh, students, uh, actually a large amount of students engage with them early on to form their own company and they are helped with their startups and, and scale ups in, in that sense, which also then provide very good opportunities to to get also more knowledge back from from the startup market and how that work and to be able to develop that in a, a better way But I foresee a future where actually we should move out more, more of our education into industry so that that the students meet with industry already in their education and um, in that way also our teachers learn more about what it's like out in industry and and the staff from the company will will uh, become much more interested in what we actually do when we're teaching so i i think that there's a huge potential to further develop that quite a bit yeah so to tighten the partnerships with you know what yeah. the job what the jobs are yeah, yeah. exactly I mean, I, yeah and i see as i said I, i've seen that in, in talking to um leaders in, in with other universities and then, for example i interviewed the dean of graduate engineering at tufts university in, in boston and one of the things that they did and this was based on input from industry they they integrated leadership and management uh, courses um so that when their engineers when when they graduated from and got a master's degree in engineering from tufts they also had you know leadership management training as well yeah. just a, as a you know as a side note um, there's, there's one thing um, I wanted to, one thing I did want to ask you was just to sort of close out the discussion on, on the digital education side and, and the approach to, you know, the optimal model, the optimal balance, you know, between online and hybrid or online and on campus and, and what you're seeing. I mean, what, what do you think in your mind, I mean, if there, there are, there are going to be deans and le presidents of universities listen in on on this i mean what would be your advice i mean what would be your sort of best practices um what would be sort of the, the top things you'd say as universities grapple with this because i think you know you went from a lot of the traditional universities before the pandemic were like old school in terms of everything was on campus there was um there, there just wasn't i think in many cases not a lot of focus on on the digital side and then the pandemic forced everyone as you as we talked about about to go 100% online but now you coming you know we're coming out of the pandemic and i think there are a lot of leaders that are grappling with okay well, what's the right balance um, yeah. what is the right approach because i think uh, yeah but how do you you know how do you balance all these things out so it'd be interesting what advice would you give leaders in in higher ed in terms of how to think about this as yeah. They so, yeah. yeah. So, so first of all, I, I mean, I speak to a lot of leaders in academia, and I, I frequently hear uh, teachers longing for the students to get back in the classroom to, so that I could deliver my lectures the way I did beforehand, and that I think is is completely dead uh, as as a strategy forward. I, I mean, the lectures have proven themselves to work even better uh, when they. Uh, uh, given digitally in that sense but but interestingly enough when we asked our students what they were missing the most uh, during the pandemic of our education they said that we're missing the breaks the breaks between the classes that's where we interact with each other where we speak to the teacher and ask our uh, specific uh, difficult questions and so forth and and so basically we need more breaks in a sense we we need to to be able to engage with the students on a more personal level and speak to them and and for the students to be able to interact with each other um, so so we need different types of formats to be able to focus on those things that that the students really struggle with. 
because the the teacher centric approach to to uh, producing a course is basically that that you've divided everything into different sections and you give equal amount of time to the different sections you have and you try to balance that in a good way but that's not the student's experience the student may experience that these things in the beginning they were pretty easy and we could have dealt with that much quicker but this particular thing was really difficult and we we should spend more time I'm here. So when you then start to work on more uh, formative uh, assessment methods, to you can actually capture, well, these things really turned out that they found were tricky. So maybe we should change and focus a bit more on, on that and provide more assignments and, and, and uh, explain more things in, in, in relation to that when, when we're there. So I think that that's an, an, an advice to do. Another advice to do is uh, to take digitalization seriously, because uh, uh, I see now that many universities look upon digitalization as a cost in their budget. They they pay things to to get uh, get something out of it, typically equipment uh, or maybe some staff to run the equipment, but but. I, I think that digitalization for university should be considered as an investment. You invest in in completely new ways of doing the things that you did beforehand. And, and there's so many excellent things that you can make use of in that sense to improve your teaching and improve your business altogether uh, at a university. And we, we don't do that. Today, teachers are embarrassed by the fact that the students are better at, at helping the, the teachers to connect their your computer to the AV equipment. Uh, and, and so therefore, uh, there are teachers that are hesitant to, to even using that equipment because they think that that's bad. I mean, we can't have it in that situation. We, we need teachers that are forerunners in the use of technology. Teachers should have new and modern technology and be the first one to try out these new things and, and use that in their education. And also to admit that you can't know everything and make use of the students and, and get the help from the students to to explore new technology and, and learn how you can use that in, in the best possible way in that. So so therefore, I think that investing in, in digital and investing in digital skills also among the staff is, is uh, very rewarding to do. So that's what I would encourage all deans and presidents and vice chancellors to do. It's uh, fascinating. Um, and just a quick analogy on this. I mean, we as a business piece of education group, this is something that we're grappling with, of course, at a different on a different level, which is that we were a business uh, pre pandemic that was all about working from an office, being there at nine o'clock, you know, in the morning, everyone had to be there at the same time. Um, uh, not a lot of openness to to remote uh, work. Um, and I think this is the this is probably similar to a lot of companies that that type of approach and then of course you went the pandemic then forced us all to work from home and now we've come out of the pandemic and and we as a as a business we went for a little bit of an evolution because there were times as you mentioned where the it was like oh the pandemic is over and then we're like okay we're gonna go back to the office and then you get a new new version of the of the, pand uh, the virus hits and then you're, you're back home so I think we've certainly evolved in our thinking where now we're completely open-minded uh, about uh, remote work and have a, a completely different approach. So it's just, it's, I guess it's the same, the same approach here, which is, which is we're, we've moved um, to an, like an employee centric model. What's best for the employee. There, there are employees who, who really like being in the office and they thrive and they, they, they like the being with others and they're folks who like to work from home and find that very effective. When it comes to your student centric model, are, are, you, are you making it up to the student to a large extent decide how they consume content or are there certain cases where you're making it mandatory for students to come to campus? I, I think that we we should provide uh, many alternative means to consume the content because uh, uh, the students are not not a homogeneous uh, population. They have very different needs and and. 
But I myself have cared quite a lot about students with disabilities as well. And, and uh, I mean, you get extra help at our university as you get from for most universities in Sweden, if you have a diagnosed uh, uh, disability that you report in. And currently there's 10% of our students that have made use of that opportunity and reported that they have a disability. And of them, a third, I mean, that, that is 500 students that are, have a cognitive disability that, that they need help for, uh, for in that sense. And what, what type of help do they need? Well, typically they need different means to consume uh, the knowledge that is needed. You you. Maybe you don't only need the lecture, maybe you need some recorded material with that, some alternative ways of, of uh, uh, getting getting to understand that type of material and, and use a mix of all of these things. Uh, and even if these are the students with the, the reported disabilities, I'm sure that there's equally many students who have not reported their their uh, special needs and therefore uh, uh, could benefit by sort of having a more much more broader and accessible way of, of uh, uh, finding a way to the uh, education material. And then when you come to things like uh, examination, uh, the assessment process, that that's that's where you also can can make use of and de develop alternative means for doing that because people have very different capabilities of of expressing their their qualities and and sometimes i think that the examination methods we're using are limiting the people's uh, the students abilities to actually show uh, what they're good at at doing in that because we we're so focused on delivering uh, uh, the grades to the students to that they should get their exam rather than they should get the knowledge uh, that they need to do do the work that they're doing so so therefore, therefore i would much more look upon upon this uh, provide the diversity of different types of ways of of doing uh, these things which means then to answer your question that that giving them the choice um, on on what they're doing alternative means for for getting that yeah and that's that's ultimately what that's student centricity right you're yeah. the student to decide uh, when to where and I guess where to consume the content, but also when to consume the content, because presumably um, what you're saying is that a student doesn't necessarily have to listen to your lecture synchronously. They could actually listen to your lecture asynchronously at midnight uh, or one in the morning or five in the morning or whatever, right? It's, it doesn't yeah. have to be um, uh, synchronous with- um, Yeah, and, and particularly now that we're trying to increase our ambitions when it comes to lifelong learning and, and going beyond the 19 to 25 years of age, uh, then you, you clearly see that, that the very strict, strict module-based uh, ways of designing our, our curriculum doesn't really fit with the needs of people that work in industry or people that have families at home and so forth. So, so, so uh, I think that we need to open up that much more. But then uh, opening it up totally would also mean that you become quite inefficient in what you're doing, right? So, so you need to have a balance all so between between uh, the student centricity and what actually makes an effective organization. Yeah. So let's then segue to lifelong learning because that's uh, you know the working adults. I think it's a great segue to the working adult side of things. And and I know you have big ambitions in that space. I can say for myself that I was recently in the United States and I met with with the Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies and also the George Washington School of Continuing Studies as well and. Both of them, both those universities are more focused than ever um, on the working adult space. Uh, they actually, they say, talking to the you know, leaders there, they, they say that they see this actually as a, a very good, I mean, they see it as a great revenue opportunity, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but what, what you, I know you have big ambitions in this area, and it'd be great for you to talk about what those ambitions are. Um, but in addition to talking about those ambitions are, it'd be very interesting to hear what's motivating KTH to expand um, into this um, into this space and what some of the trends are. 
in your in that space in Sweden, for example? Yeah. yeah. So uh, first of all, I think it's uh, important to sort of define what we mean with lifelong learning, because basically you start learning long before you start at the university, right? So, so um, for, for me, lifelong learning is actually to show that the things that we are doing may have an impact even in younger ages. And, and we need to show what a university is and what knowledge we produce and how we can, can help later on in the process very early on, because one of the consequences we have today is, uh, for example, that very few students uh, want to do computer science. Um, so computer science or digital uh, uh, advanced digital skills is an area where we have negative unemployment rate uh, currently. There's not enough people to take the jobs that we're having. So I think that by focusing on lifelong learning and also trying to, to be active in the earlier ages, we, we can manage to spread an interest into this field and get more people interested in taking our classes uh, onwards in that. And then when you think about what happens after graduation, uh, first of all, I think that, that and, and this is a very personal comment that maybe not all teachers in Sweden would share, but I think it's a shame that we're focusing so much on the exam, because the exam is a clear marker that this means that now you're through with university. We say bye bye to you, you should never come back. And, and rather, I would want to see a more smooth transition out into the industry uh, where, or public sector when people start working so that you continue to refuel knowledge throughout your working life. And, and I've said as a, a, a goal for myself when I speak about this, that I actually believe in a future where people will spend 10 to 20 percent of their working time uh, re-educating themselves or refueling knowledge throughout their entire uh, career, regardless of which type of work you have, actually. I think that that's uh, what, what is needed. Also for your own, own personal uh, development and personal growth's sake in, in, in that sense. So you, you, you had a concept, I don't remember what it was in your question, but you were talking about, uh, it sounded like we were educating the working population, but I also think that we should educate the non-working population that are between jobs and, and, and that needs to sort of change track in what they're doing to, to come into something completely different. And I've had the opportunity for the last 10 years to, to also work as, as an advisor to our ministers of digitalization and provide input to, to policy and policy making in, in this. And all the time during these 10 years, I've, I've strongly argued more for lifelong learning because I think that this is really crucial for the development of, of uh, of our country, for our growth as a nation, that we were able to 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 provide much more lifelong learning. And at the time, I mean, five years ago, I think that the the uh, annual throughput of of uh, lifelong learning uh, as a share of our entire education uh, throughput at our university was far less than 1%. It was like a half a percent or something like that. And uh, now uh, our vice president for education at KTH has set the ambition that by 2023, 20% uh, of our education should be lifelong learning. I mean, going from under one to 20 uh, in a few years time is a huge undertaking to do. I'm, I'm perfectly uh, aware that we will not reach that level at all, but we need to start thinking about lifelong learning in a different way. I, I personally, I've, I've always uh, been the one raising my hand saying that I want to do the industry courses because I think they're so rewarding as a teacher to give. I get students that are knowledgeable and well motivated for what they're doing. They bring interesting cases from their industry into what they're doing. I learn so much being a teacher for, for those classes. But I also see many universities that think about how they're ranked based on the 
master's and bachelor's programs that they have. And therefore, they staff their, those educations first. And then if they have any teachers left uh, and get some commissioned education to go, go, they send these teachers that weren't, weren't good enough for the other things to do that type of education. And, and that way we cannot work. We really need to send our best teachers, I think, to do this, this type of, of education. Um, but then these have also been two totally separate things. I think that in the future, we need much more to, to integrate uh, uh, the uh, lifelong learning education with our normal education so that our students get to meet the people in industry that need to, to educate themselves and, and vice versa. I mean, it will help our students build a network of, of uh, industrial contacts out in the industry. It will help uh, help the, the uh, uh, people from industry to get some uh, connections into the youth that they may want to employ in the future and so forth. So, so I think that they, there's huge needs here in, in, in uh, making that happen. And I'm, I've argued that and, uh, for a long time then, and I now see various political measures to try to, to uh, manage this. I mean, uh, not long ago, I think it was last week, the Minister of Education in Sweden said that they're now trying to, to implement a, a big investment in, in um, uh, reskilling to support for for people that want to get a, a, a new education, P people that are working that want to change track, for example. And, and uh, I think that that's a great um, way of doing things. But then we at a university must also be prepared to change the way that we teach things so that we actually te teach the things that industry needs uh, in that sense, and not only the theoretical things that we want to do. And then I also think that we need to collaborate much more between the academic institutions and all of those private and, and uh, uh, teaching organizations that work with uh, education as well, because we have completely different ways of educating, but we have a lot to learn from each other. And, and there's a huge potential there in collaborating and make use of each other's skills in, in developing that further. So it's just related to that, um, the lifelong learning and this ambition um, of getting to 20%. I'm just curious how, there, I guess there are two questions that relate to the, that goal of 20%. How are you able to recruit those students? I mean, what's the approach to actually recruiting students to these programs? And I think the second obvious question is, how do you scale the, the infrastructure or, or the, how, how do you scale in order to meet the demands of that yeah. population? Um, I'm curious about those two questions <coughs> related to that goal. Because you said yeah. it's 20% in 2023, right? That's that's like next year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is, and and uh, scaling uh, is uh, is of course important in that. And and typically today we have a, a reward system at the university where we fund it based on how many students we have and how many we graduate. Right. So so there's not really an incentive in the funding system to 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 actually uh, um, uh, become more efficient in the teaching that you're 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 doing, but I I usually have an example that I think is quite interesting. A course that that in this first MOOC wave that we had, got some funding to turn their course into a digital one, uh, and it was typically a course in the very last year of the engineering education in finite element methods i think it was or something like that and they they uh, uh, they turned it into a digital one and they went from from uh, 20 students per year to now having close to 10000 students per year and of course, if you have 10,000 students per year, you, you can't run it in, in a classroom, not even a digital classroom to make that work in a good way. You need to automatize things. You need to develop it, it uh, further. You need to, to uh, maybe base assessment more on peer review related things and, and so forth on this. And so they, they invested quite a bit in doing really well-produced lectures that, that presented the, the course content in a good way. They designed 
uh, tasks and assignments that could be individually constructed uh, using AI and so forth that could be automatically corrected so that you actually could progress through the education in, in uh, this way. And then 10,000 students want to follow this course, but as most of those 10,000 students who come from all over the world are not really uh, uh, very interested in the grades, they are interested in the knowledge. So, so they rarely actually make the assessment in the end, they, they sort of listen to the knowledge and take that one in. So if you have a system that is based on funding coming in based on how many students or how big share that, that actually graduate, then you have a faulty system. I, I would say in that sense. So um, uh, I think that, that uh, this shows how, how you really need also to change the entire business model around higher education to, to fit with, with those kind of needs so that we can bring in much more students. And does it take a lot more time to graduate 10,000 students than, than to, to, or to, to educate 10,000 students rather than, than the 20 you had? Uh, beforehand, yeah, maybe a little bit more work, but but most of that went into the preparation and designing these systems to to fit fit this need. So if we we can reuse that uh, uh, experiences that you learned in that uh, much more in in what what you're doing, I think that that would be that would be a great thing to do. Another example of something completely uh, different that, that I think is an experience that we made here that I'm very proud of is that we we launched something that we call the Software Development Academy uh, based on fund, uh, private funding from the Wallenberg uh, Foundation, uh, which was then meant to be a specialized uh, uh, education equivalent to a bachelor in in computer science uh, uh, and we we uh, four students that are newly arrived immigrants uh, they came they didn't may, maybe didn't even have the papers to show their qualifications in a sense but they had some form of education with them and it turned out that we could actually educate them close to a, the level of bachelors by a, a 12 to 14 week education a very intensive education that we could could provide to them. So so we designed the curriculum specialized for for this and for collaboration between these students. And it turned out that these students became the most popular ones on the labor market afterwards because they they were really motivated. They had really quickly built the the, the most modern skills and in, in what they were doing. But we're, we're not using the ordinary um, systems that we, we use w since we're a public authority when we, we, we uh, hired this. We, need to, uh, we needed to sort of do a bit of skunk work in terms of managing that um, in, in that sense, because these students couldn't go through the normal admissions procedures that we have because most of them didn't have any paperwork with them. So we needed to interview them and take them in through through the the normal uh, through unconventional ways of doing this then so we're not doing this as a public authority this then becomes like commissioned education because we yeah. got this external funding to to do this but then again according to the laws in sweden we couldn't um, we couldn't educate these students through uh, uh, commissioned education because commissioned education is based on the fact that there's a company that should pay for somebody's education because you can't come as an individual and acquire uh, an education uh, here that that wouldn't follow the the law in that sense so therefore we actually came up with a mechanism where we had a recruitment company that hired our student and commissioned the education for us and we we gave them the money to buy the education back from us and and in that way could, we could actually follow the law completely to do this but this wasn't really what a university is meant to do the way it has been designed today but it, it's really a very good case of, of how you can make a, a, a true impact and in a short period of time and, and help to sort of fill the gap of all, all of those uh, available job positions in, in the digital area where you don't find any people that applies for, for these jobs. So, so I would want to see more of these, these sort of specialized designed ways of doing things to, to manage those 
skills in a sense. Okay. Very, very interesting. Um, and, and all the best with the 20% target next year. Yeah. <laughs> vicious. I mean, I love it. It's, it's important, super important, uh, you know, in this day and age, of course, that there's, there are educational opportunities for, for working adults that are looking to um, gain new skills, looking to reskill. Um, so it's, it's super important work that, that your institution is doing and many other institutions are doing um, to address um, because the pace of change, I think, is accelerating. So it's important to have you know, resources like yours. One thing I wanted to make sure that we, we covered was really your, your background. And that's something that I, I always am, have asked my guests. And I find it fascinating to just understand what, how do people end up where they end up? And, and yeah. uh, what was the journey? And yeah. I've, when I've when I've listened to this various stories, they've been absolutely fascinating. You know how people end up in education, number one, but also end up in educational leadership. So I'm just it'd be great to hear, you know, your your background, your story, your journey, um, how how you ended up where you are. Uh, something maybe something about your background. I've I've heard that from a number of my guests that they had something in their upbringing that um, influenced their direction to actually go into education. So anyway, I'd love yeah. to hear, and I know the those listening would love to hear kind of your journey. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be happy to share that. And, and forgive me if it becomes a bit lengthy here, we may, maybe need to cut it down, but, but I think it's interesting in a sense because I have a maybe a strange background in this sense because uh, I, I, uh, I'm Norwegian uh, originally, and my, my parents immigrated into Sweden uh, to, to come here to work. And my father unfortunately died when I was quite young, so, but we stayed on here. And as a kid, I was extremely interested in mathematics. So already at the age of seven, I, I sort of had finished the books that the, the, those that the age of nine had, were doing and, and sort of. so. I was 14 or something like that when I started doing university mathematics uh, because I just was so fascinated by, by this subject. But then following the Swedish system, I wasn't allowed to graduate uh, because I didn't have a degree in Swedish and English, uh, but I was good at mathematics. So I, I could never get any grades from the university at that point, even if I took the courses. And I became so fed up with this, so I completely abandoned this area at all and and, and actually became quite a, a difficult child for for the uh, for my teachers, I think in in school around my teenager years. And I started doing uh, what ha has since become my passion to do. I started playing theater and music and acting and playing, writing plays and so forth, and uh, which I love to do. And I still today think that the the knowledge I acquired with within theater is the mo single most important knowledge that I have. I may be professor in the field, but but it is the theater that that really gets me going into that. So so uh, I wanted to go into theater school, acting schools, or directing schools and so forth, uh, which is really, really competitive. And if you're 18, 19, 20 and try to do that, it's very difficult. You usually need to, to try many times. So eventually I found out that maybe it's a difficult career choice to choose acting and then have mathematics as a hobby. So, so maybe I, I should flip that around. So I started doing engineering physics at Uppsala University. And why, why engineering physics? Well, I don't know. Somebody told me it was the most difficult thing you could do. So, so I thought it, it fitted my, my interest for mathematics in a sense. But I still spent most of my time acting and doing things on that on, on my spare time uh, on things like that. So I wasn't probably the best student. Uh, I, I barely made each course. And, and uh, in the end, I actually were, some of the courses uh, were a bit delayed before I actually managed them. So in the end, I had to come up with a way of earning money. Uh, and I, I was thinking, well, 
if I'm now interested in mathematics and physics and like acting, what, what's the ba best way to, to, to uh, harvest that type of combination? Well, it's education, it's teaching. So, so I asked uh, the, the professor I thought that was the best teacher I had, uh, but do you need some help? Do you want somebody to come and help you teach? And, and so I went into systems analysis because I liked that professor a lot and, and helped in teaching. And all of a sudden he started asking for my PhD. I, I, I really didn't know that I was enrolled in the PhD education. It was, was so informal at that point of time. So, so I did that. And in my PhD, I also went into studying things that I thought was much more rewarding at the time, doing psychology, sociology, design. and other subjects in that sense. So I really became passionate for the transdisciplinary knowledge, mixing different subjects in, in a, a, a truly good way. And um, my supervisor, he was an action researcher, meaning that, that we were out trying to change uh, how companies were, were doing things. And, and I spent actually 10 years of my time as a researcher trying to work with the Swedish National Tax Board through their digitalization journey. All the way from it was a completely paper bound authority until it was completely digitalized 10 years later. So, so that was really fascinating. And, and also doing that by actually helping them to digitalize. So, so, so that's what an action research should do, which then also involves a lot of education. So, so, uh, so therefore, I, I became interested in this change, being a change agent in, in a sense and working with that. And uh, uh, then subsequently, I, I became also more interested in leadership because I saw that, that that's where you could have some impact and actually influence the things and not only complain about the, the things that weren't uh, really working the way I wanted. Because as being a leader, I could actually change the things that I previously was complaining about. So I, I took that role and, and I, I actually discovered that I was quite good at it. I managed to create more change uh, than many of, of uh, my predecessors in, in these roles. So, so therefore I took more and more university related roles. And then, then 10 years ago, a friend of mine uh, uh, brought me to a seminar uh, that that I did uh, that was done at the government and uh, uh, that seminar then um, uh, was done by the minister of, of uh, IT and energy at the time and was about the digital agenda of Sweden and they wanted input uh, to that and, and being a person with a theater background I think I know how to express the few few things you get to say in a big meeting such as that so so uh, a, a few weeks later I, I, I got a call from the minister saying that do you want to head our digital commission for the government and, and uh, do this and of course, as a person then arguing for the fact that I, I want to change things, I just couldn't say no to that, that opportunity, even though I'm not Swedish. Uh, I'm Norwegian, but not even a member of EU that could help the Swedish government uh, improve these things. And I think I've done a quite good job in, in policy making and, and providing advice to our ministers since uh, I don't think there's anybody that has managed to stay on for 10 years and in, in um, that role. I've survived six ministers from three different parties in, in digitalization uh, in that sense. So I, I find that quite fascinating as a way to to improve and change the things that you're doing but mm -hmm. but but then again what i always come back to is this theater background that that has influenced so much theater is the greatest thing you can do for for uh, appearing here and in your podcast or for being a teacher or for being a manager or for conveying a message to the audience you want to to um, uh, influence in that sense. So if there's one subject that I want would want to be mandatory for everybody, it would be drama. Duly noted. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> um, that's terrific. Um, and I mean, what, what do, I mean, obviously 
you have many years ahead, of course, in, in terms of your, your career, but like when you, when you look back, what are you most proud of um, over the last year? What sort of things do you look, can you look at in the past and say, I'm really proud of X, Y, and Z? Yeah. So I, I think that, that uh, what, what I'm most proud of, of is, is the, the sense of change that I managed to, to get different types of, of organizations, both within academia and outside the academia, to, to, to actually embrace and, and make use of and, and see that it is possible to change. I mean, I was giving a, a speech at one point uh, for all the rectors, uh, all the presidents of, of the universities in Sweden. And I was talking about digitalization and our needs to be more modern and change these things. And at that point, the vice chancellor of Uppsala University, the oldest university in, in Sweden, were, were listening to me and she became very upset and said, well, Uppsala University has had the same business model for 500 years. It's going to last for another 500 years. And I said, no, I don't think so. And I, I think that she realized afterwards that that was maybe not the wisest thing to say. But I think now that, that I've contributed to getting the, the, the sense of urgency into the academic sector that we are in a transition period. Higher education and research is changing fundamentally in, in completely new ways than they had before. And we need to rethink that, that uh, the role we have and, and how we're doing things. And I, I think if I can, if I have done anything, I think I've contributed to that discussion and to, to this sense of the need to change. Uh, but beyond that, I would say that, that every student I've had over the years is also a very rewarding thing. Seeing young people develop, learn new things and, and come back and, and 10 years later saying that you remember the things you said at that lecture, that's really what actually shaped my entire career. Then you become really proud of, of uh, what you're doing in a sense. Yeah, no doubt uh, that you're having tremendous impact on people's lives. No, there's no question about it when you're in your, your position, in the position of a, of a professor as well. So what, what do you sort of ending with where we started? Um, what's, what, how do you see KTH in 10 years? I mean, how in your, your vision, what would KTH or what should KTH look like in in 10 years in, in your mind? I think it's uh, uh, maybe from the outside, it's gonna look very much the same. I mean, the building beside me here on the picture is, is uh, our, our logo and, and our main building in a sense. And, and it's gonna probably look the same, but I think it's gonna look completely different from the inside. I think that, that uh, at that point, our university has understood that, that uh, it, it can use and have used digitalization to fundamentally transform all the business that we're doing, meaning everything from the education we're doing to the research we're doing to the admin uh, tasks that we have that have been, been uh, truly automatized and, and, and improved in, in uh, that sense. I think that the education through digitalization has the capability to become much more modularized and, and we could sort of provide smaller snippets of knowledge that could be much more easily consumed by by everybody so so hopefully we would be um, even if it's not 100 percent digital i would foresee a like a spotify of higher education in that sense where you could uh, get your your best playlists on on uh, the education and, and uh, yeah. uh, follow that and, and acquire the skills that you need for the particular task that you're doing. Meaning that all people out there that are working will have a much richer life where they they will not educate themselves to something and graduate by, by the age of 25 and then work for 40 years with exactly the same profession and tasks throughout their life, but actually changing and continuing to develop and thrive 
uh, through their life and careers in in uh, that sense, and and that is what I think that we as a university uh, uh, need to, to embrace in that sense. Hmm. Interesting. And then I, I, it's to uh, it's I, I just have to ask this question because I'm fascinated myself. You know, with I mean, obviously with the, with the pandemic, um, as we all know, there's been a very very rapid move to universities launching online education for we we see that and we've seen that in terms of the the traffic to our online studies.com websites we've seen that in terms of customer demand from our from from our customers and prospects they want help in recruiting students for their online program so there's there's really just um, i think an incredible movement going on today in the whole online education space and obviously a lot of the you have a whole range of universities that are uh, in the space. I mean, a ton more than there were before, and many of the branded universities. Um, uh, for you know, Johns Hopkins, for example, one of our customers, they're they're expanding a lot in the space. Um, but then there are also players like IU University of Applied Science Sciences in Germany. They're they're um, they have eighty five thousand uh, students. It's pretty much one hundred percent online. I uh, interviewed the, the CEO. Of Bayou University, um, so and they're a little bit more, you know, more of a private, you know, institution. Whereas you know, Johns Hopkins is it's a it's a I think a, a business to some extent, but it's positioned as a nonprofit. So how do you how do you think this is all gonna gonna look in in five years? How is the space gonna look? Who are the who are the winners gonna be? I'm just curious your perspective. Um, yeah. I think that there's actually a huge difference between the ways it looks in in big countries like the United States and, and their abilities to work in this. The fact that KTH together with Chalmers is such a big leader in terms of providing nationally here uh, the engineers that we need for our future is is probably uh, i wouldn't say it's an unthreatened position to have but i think that that in that sense the national players will be very important to to sort of make the stamina of of the 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 educated staff that that you're working with and also maybe providing the education in in our own language in that sense so i so i think that that will be be uh, still happening in that way but i think that that uh, there's going to be quite a lot of new, uh, newly established companies working in the digital sector that that will uh, be sort of taking over parts of of the the higher education that we're delivering and providing it through completely new ways of doing that. And and the the question is then how should we sort of fight this uh, fierce competition in this sense? Well, I think we need to embrace it. I need we think we need to collaborate with them and, and uh, work to, to provide the best uh, possible opportunity in that because there's some people arguing that well in the future higher education institutions and, and particularly public so will uh, eventually simply work with assessment and certification and, and the actually transformation uh, or tr transmitting the knowledge would be given to to um, YouTube or or uh, new startups or or our uh, TV channels or, or so forth, uh, in this sense. But I don't believe that that's uh, gonna happen because I think that assessment and and delivering education and also producing research is is intertwined and it needs to be so. And if we want to maintain that position, we need to be a bit more open to change and collaboration also with those that may be seen as our competitors in the future. Okay. Well, thanks very much um, for your time. It's been a real pleasure uh, speaking with you. Um, I've enjoyed every minute of it. I wish we had more time. I wish we had another hour. Thank you. There's, there's, yes. so, much more, there's so much more to talk about, actually. Um, I could have a much longer question list than I, than I had, but I, I really enjoyed it. I really appreciate the time. Uh, so thanks. thanks. Appreciate it.